Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross. With me as always is Mark Ainley. Mark, two in one day. I get to see you again. How's it going? Yeah, I put a hat on just in case anyone watched the YouTube video so it doesn't look like I wear the same thing uh, every show. <laughs> <laughs> you should have done the, the glasses with the mustache. I know, I know. I got rid of my Halloween costumes. I, I would have uh, came with a, a, a nice big fro that I had for one of my uh, costumes. <laughs> there you go. So uh, I know you just, uh, before getting this call, we were just talking about you referred someone over to Aaron Zimmerman, who's our, our uh, guest on episode 52, but it got us talking about just accounting, right? And just the importance of it. Yeah, it's that time of year. I, I know uh, I had to write a couple of checks here in the last couple of months, uh, pretty large checks that uh, that I'm really guided by my my CPA and, and all the advice that they give me through my, you know, I, I think it's not just your one tax return when you start uh, to scale, it ends up being your different tax returns that that flow into your other tax returns that flow into some sort of other tax stop before it gets you personally. So, uh, and that doesn't all happen in one year and it's something that happens over time. And, and I think it's just important that uh, anyone that's looking to scale, start now with the uh, CPA that you're, that you want to work with or find that CPA. I, I know for me, I, I went through, you know, from 2003 to now, I think I've gone through three, three of them. You know, one I outgrew, one retired and, or one retired, one I outgrew. Um, and then uh, the other where I'm at now, I, hopefully it'll be around for the next 20 years. But uh I think you have to just get comfortable with that person and, and uh, their guidance. And so to get sooner than later, if you're, if you're buying properties this year or planning on buying properties uh, this year, like you probably shouldn't be filing your tax to H&R Block anymore. Uh, so make sure you're seeking <laughs> yeah, it's time, out. time to upgrade there. Yes. It, it, I guess one other note too, just account for those expenses and every, however you want to do it. But every time you're going to spin up a new LLC, it's not just, oh, I got to pay to spin this up. Like it's another, it's another filing, right? Um, as you grow, your taxes will get more complicated. It will become a legit expense to you. Exactly. So it ties in nicely. We're going to talk about scaling today. But, but before we do that, what's our housing provider tip of the week? All right. So this is a housing provider tip of the week. I, a lot of people, including myself early on, uh, would, would pass this, this thought and, and deal with the problem later, which was, was silly. You know, you have your, your, on, on any your, your, whether it be a single family home or your, your two flat, your three flat, north side, south side, uh, you, you have little gaps that get in your soffits and get in the corner of your property. You know, sometimes you'll see uh, the little crack there. These animals get into your roofs, your, your, your little gap between you. If you got a flat roof between your, your second floor ceiling and, and the actual roof or your, your pitched attics, and they are tougher to get rid of than the actual tenants here in Cook County. So <laughs> what I'm saying is make sure that your house is sealed up. Uh, you know, if you see the smallest crack, you might think, ah, nothing can fit in there. Think about this. Uh, mice can get into something that is the size of a nickel. They, they can manipulate their body to get into something the size of a nickel. The same with around your outlets inside the house, but that's a different tip. But on the outside, when you see the, if you're two stories down and you see a little hole, if you can see a little hole from two stories down, there's a good chance an animal can get in there. And, and you get into these uh, scenarios where you have to hire a professional to get rid of it. It's not your handyman that's going to go uh, crawl up there and, and be able to bait out the family of raccoons. Now, you might have a handyman that can do that, but usually you're going to have to invest them into some sort of uh, wildlife pest control at that point. So make sure that you're uh, and then on top of it, you got to deal with the resident that's freaking out. Residents freak out when you got a raccoon that's running above your head uh, there. We've inherited a couple of those problems in the last couple of years, and, and it's uh if anything, now before we bring out a property, I'm looking that much closer to make sure we're not dealing with that one problem. So keep in mind, keep all of your, your outside, keep the outside outside from your inside. So good stuff. All right. Today's guest brought to us by Renovo. So we appreciate the, the referrals from our friends over there. Um, but today we're going to talk about scaling. We're going to talk about the South side. We're going to talk about being bullish on Chicago. Just, just so much to cover here. Um, but our, our guest today started out while working a W2 job got up to 80 units before leaving the insurance industry, uh, then opened Icarus Investment Group at the age of 26. He has grown them to over 1,400 units on the South Side and counting, uh, revitalizing neighborhoods, expanding to new areas where others dare not go. Uh, we're gonna talk about a 300 plus unit deal he did right uh, around Midway. A, a ton of great information from, from someone who is just killing it here. Uh, so without further ado, David Pizzola, welcome to the show. David, how are we doing today? Doing good, doing good. Thank you. We we we're excited to have you, man. So, one of the one of the motifs is going to be scaling. So, before we talk about Icarus, I I want to hit on having eighty units under your belt while working a W two. As someone who was dabbling in both worlds for probably too long before leaving the W two, man, what? Let's talk about that. That had to be hectic. How did first off? How did we get to eighty? Like, let's talk about the first deal, and let's talk about how did you balance that? Because that is a that's a high number. 
Yeah. So it started off just uh, buying condos in 2012, maybe 2011, I forget. Yeah, 2012, uh, in the West Loop and South Loop. Just the opportunity made sense. Uh, I was seeing condos for less than 200 grand, and you could rent them out for, for 2,000. So it just simp- wasn't, I wouldn't even call myself really a, a real estate investor then. It was just that I saw an opportunity. And the reason why I saw an opportunity is because I used to live in LA, in downtown LA, where I moved out for a job with AIG in New York and ended up having to rent out that unit. And that was the first time I became a landlord. And Renting out that unit, I was making some positive cash flow to where all of a sudden, from being a novice, that seemed like the better investment that I had made uh, out of anything else I'd ever invested in and figured this is kind of on accident. Let's see if I can buy another one in LA where I was familiar because that's where I used to live. By the time I went to go buy another one, uh, the condo value had gone up by so much that it didn't make sense to invest there. So I had to find a different market, but it was actually very easy to manage a condo uh, from New York, manage a condo in LA. So I figured there was no city that was really off limits. So I started looking at it globally and on a macro level, it seemed like Chicago made the most sense, which is how I got into Chicago in the first place. And then eventually my first condo I bought, uh, and I forget which one came first, I bought them pretty close one after another, was either at 1645 West Ogden, bought a condo there. And then simultaneously I bought a condo at 1620 South Michigan. Um, which I did light renovations on remotely, just literally hiring a, a GC that uh, my realtor knew uh, to do a very light renovation and then rented out both units pretty rapidly um, for, for about 2000 bucks a piece. So it made sense. There's positive cash flow, and I just started doing more. And that's kind of how it started. Uh, but to get to 80, there's a lot of things that happened along the way over in the next basically couple, two to three. It took about two to three years from there, three years to get to 80 from two units. Um, but yeah. So r- real quick, the first thing that's probably coming to our listeners heads who right now own three units, 10 units and are trying to get their capital, right? Uh, how are we, how are we e- either financing all these? Are we pulling money out of existing deals, et cetera? And you don't have to go super in the weeds, but just talk about that. Cause I think that's one of the, the hardest parts regardless of the market's up or down is at some point you run out of capital. Right. So the, the first two units, uh, were basically 20% down. Uh, and I, I had done well enough at AIG with commissions to be able to put that down and then get a loan for 80%. And then the way I got additional deals done and got additional capital was I was doing well at AIG. So I was making uh, decent commissions over there is my LA condo, which what I had originally bought for 230 grand uh, much prior to that, all of a sudden was worth about, I think it praised out at around 500. So that allowed me to do a refinance on that it was substantial, allowed me to pull out additional cash tax-free. And then I used that as my down payment to buy additional condos in the West Loop and South Loop. And then the way that I got further than there is that I, I was fortunate enough that the West Loop got red hot, uh, basically starting as soon as I bought. And that wasn't just me. I, I got lucky that I picked two markets that really shot up, especially the West Loop. Uh, and I sold a condo in 1645 Ogden and 1031'd it. And with additional cash, was able to start buying condos in cash in the South side. And at that same time, I was going to my clients and friends and other people kind of explaining what I was doing sort of on accident and started asking people if they wanted to, you know, JV with me and start doing these deals. And that's kind of how it started. Good stuff, man. So two, two questions. One, do you see any similarities to any existing Chicago markets to what you saw in the West Loop back then, right? Is there anything that our listeners can pull from? Because th- that boat was most likely missed, you know, given today being, you know, 2022. And do you see any similarities in other neighborhoods here in Chicago? And then also, separate question, but man, why not leave it like after 40 units? I mean, you hung on for a, a long time. There was AIG just that it was a, that good of a job where it's, hey, I want to hold on to this thing. Well, so actually, I ended up getting a lot of pressure from AIG to leave because I let them know what I was doing. And I got recruited by Mutual of Omaha uh, to come over there. And they said that they were okay with me doing this on the side. So because I was supportive and, and also this is still feast or famine. So even when I had, I actually think I left AIG probably around maybe 20 units or so I left um, and went to Mutual Omaha. And obviously 20, 20 units when 
it's you're still like you know trying to keep them occupied that wasn't enough to live off of and it was a huge decrease from what i was making at aig mm-hmm. but even at mutual, when i went to mutual omaha even when i got to 80 units it still wasn't like it was all 100 percent occupied 100 percent cash flowing all the time it was still a lot of churn to where it was good to have that steady income uh from, from my my and i was w- willing to like work seven days a week and work you know basically 10 hours a day on my corporate job and then until I passed out on uh, my, my real estate job to make sure everything was still moving. But at 80, it was completely overwhelming. There's no way I could do both things sustainably for any period longer. Uh, it, because it was, it was just absolutely crushing. They're both more than full-time jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then eventually I just, I just had to leave. Now, while I was uh, at Mutual of Omaha, I, I had been approached by an investor to where they, they offered me uh, they'd offered to invest in Icarus, which at the time just owned uh, the handful of units that or you know, a little less. They started talking to me when it was probably about like 30, 40 units. And they offered to, you know, put up cash in exchange for a small percentage of Icarus, but more importantly, to give me a credit line uh, of where I could go and buy more. And that was the better part of the deal. Now the cash was great because it allowed me to step away from mutual Omaha, but the more important part was the credit line, which allowed me to continue to buy, which, which was, that was the much more important part of the deal. At the time, I was more concerned about valuation than the credit line, but the credit line should have been all I was concerned about because that's really what I needed to get from 80 to basically 400 over the next couple of years after that. Got it. Let's table my question on neighborhoods. Let's, let's go down this thread for a second here. So, okay, so you get the credit line. Do you hire a team at that point, right? Like how, what's the, what are the first steps now that we have a, a bankroll what happens next? So the bankroll wasn't for uh, my organization. The bankroll was actually for acquisitions. The cash, which I originally thought I was going to pocket um, in exchange for selling some equity, pretty soon became the bankroll for for growth and to hire more people. But even then, because I watched that cash that I get where I, where I, where I got, where I sold some of the equity, uh, and, and I wanted to have that be mine. But then pretty quickly, it was it was clear that I couldn't grow without having additional people in house. So we made our first hire uh, of like true employee of our company, uh, not, not, not counting maintenance people that we had and, and other sorts of things, but a true actual in-house employee. Cause I was actually effectively the property manager for our first 80 units where I was, you know, coordinating maintenance people to get there and doing everything, making the collection calls. I was doing it all myself, like remote property manager living in uh, New York on 80 units in Chicago. Uh, and my first hire in house was I realized my weakest point was closing out my books just because I wasn't excellent at accounting and bookkeeping. And also that was what was nails on a chalkboard to me. So I hired a CPA to be my controller. I hired uh, Jessica Coons, who's currently actually my COO, uh, but she grew from controller to understand her whole operation. And now she's our COO, but that was my first hire in 2015. And uh, shortly after that, about a year a year later was my second hire and uh, brought in uh, Jared Snyder, who is we brought him in as a project manager. His role evolved a ton from then until now. Currently, he's our VP. And uh, both of them were in my well, Jessica was in a one person WeWork office with me from when she got hired. Uh, We found one weirdly shaped WeWork office where it actually could kind of fit two desks. And we both <laughs> stuffed ourselves in there and, and she heard every phone call I made all day. And I was on the phone constantly with lenders, investors, brokers, everything. And I think that was actually really helpful while probably pretty annoying is that she got to hear everything that was going on. So she had her vantage point of accounting and being a controller and her experience as a CPA, but she learned everything kind of through osmosis by just being in that tiny room with me for a year straight, you know, working seven days a week and uh, 10 hour days, if not longer. And then Jared, when he came in, we found an oddly shaped two-person office that could fit three of us. And then similar thing where he kind of learned a lot from osmosis. And so those were my original two uh, hires. That's awesome. That's awesome. And they're also there. So that's cool. So, you know, going on these first 400 units, what time were you doing major rehabs? Were, were they, I was, I always call them uh, partial um, or 70% gut rehabs. Like what kind of uh, work were you guys having to do on that? Just so it kind of get, give everyone the mindset of how much scope was. Yeah. Times 400. To start off with, 
condos. Um, and that was excellent because a lot of times behind the walls were great because these were like 2004, uh, full condo renovation or in some cases, I think were ground up some case they took a building and they totally got rehabbed it and made it into really nice units. So that was great because we didn't have to really, you know, go behind the walls and it was just purely a little bit of cosmetic touch up. But as we got uh, bigger, it was harder to find condo deals. And also it wasn't as scalable because to buy some condos and to assume you'll be able to buy the whole building is, is, a, is a bad assumption because it is a lot of steps to get there and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So we found ourselves a lot of condo buildings. We owned a lot of condos in the building, but not the whole building. And that was really tough to get debt on because if you own, you know, four condos in 2015 on a 12 unit building, no one wanted to touch that with a loan. Like it was just, it was a non warrantable condo building. It was impossible to capitalize, but the cap rates were actually totally insane. Like we were buying some stuff where the cap rates were like 35% and stuff like that. Uh, so while it was not financeable, it's a higher yield than for the most part, anything we can find now with even perfect leverage. So it made sense. It just wasn't a scalable strategy because it was really hard to find it. And then you also had um, a lot of things that could go wrong where the roof could go wrong and you own three units of 24 and then you have yours are on the third floor and you have most of the third floor units. So no one cares about the roof. And so you basically have to front paying for a whole roof for a large building and you only own you know, 12% of it. And, uh, things like that were, were how we started to learn about doing bigger renovations. Cause we had, we got caught on some things like that where we got a little unlucky. Um, but then we started buying bigger buildings, even though the cap rates were much lower, uh, and doing so we, we slowly but surely kind of built a network of GCs and it was everything from just light renovations to, you know, your 70% guts to some full guts, but it was really all over the board. And, we did find a lot of buildings that were former condo buildings that someone else aggregated all the condos that we could buy those buildings. And they were a little bit of premium, but I wish I did more of those because those ones we had the least amount of problems with, because at some point they were probably had their COO or they had, you know, the full inspections and there's really nothing wrong with them. It was the older buildings that had been partially renovated, but behind the walls had issues uh, that were the most challenging and, and the biggest learning curve on, on how to get those, uh, you know, back in shape and out of building court. I still remember it had been 2011, 2012. I made an offer on a property at 1645 West Octon, two bedroom, two bath. And uh, it was facing the courtyard. It was kind of a weird building. So it was facing the middle and I had one of the beams in the second bedroom. And I, I justified not raising a price up to 87.5 from the 79 that, that I was very firm on, <laughs> on, on not going over to. So uh, man, like I, I imagine that thing's going for over 250 now, but, uh, it's just, it's funny that you brought up that address cause it's a pain point for me and memorized memories, but, uh, yeah, that building was really interesting. And, and actually that was kind of, uh, uh, that was a really interesting building. Cause I actually ended up buying three units in, in that building in the early days. Uh, my first one I bought for 112, it was a two bedroom, two bath that I still have, uh, that faces kind of like North West. And a pretty good view. And the other two I bought also two, one was two bed, two bath, one was a three bed, two bath. And I bought them in a package deal for 300. So that was like 150 each. And those ones I sold. And it's funny, I talk about how I 1031 them, but the first one that I sold there, I still only sold for 240. But at the time, that was like a record setting price. And the main difference why those went up in value so much so quickly is because the HOA wasn't uh, taking enough money in to hit the reserve requirement. They were only taking an 8% of, of HOA dues. And, and if they took in 10%, that was enough. So like a 2% raise and having it all go to reserves is all they needed to really do to make it warrantable. And when I realized like, you know, that I, I was thinking, okay, well, I, if I fix that problem, then everyone get loans in the building and that, and it's just a slight tweak. And that's literally all it took. And then people started setting record comps like on a monthly basis. And it was just, Next trade was I think 175, and then a then a two two went for 200, and so when I saw that happening, I sold mine. That that was a big pop for being able 1031. Before we go on with scaling, can you just talk about making a condo warrantable for our listeners who don't understand? Hey, what does that mean? You know, just give a little uh, give the 30 second rundown if you don't mind. Yeah, and I, and of course I'm not as dialed into it anymore uh, because I'm not really going to buy condos at this point. But basically, if if you can get a conventional mortgage on a condo building, a lot of times it's just simply a binary yes, no. 
And, and there's basically three things, at least when I was doing this heavily, that would make a building not warrantable or warrantable. Uh, one of them is a set amount of reserves per unit, and that varies. It could be, as, I think, three grand a unit is, I think, a, a lot of times the minimum. Uh, there needs to be less than 51 per, or less than 50% need to be investor, it could be investor owned. So you have to have 50% or more owner occupied. And I believe also 10% of all collected HOA dues must be going to a reserve. So I think if you have those three things, I think a building's warrantable generally where you can get conventional financing. And I've heard some lenders now are doing um, non-conventional financing on non-warrantable condo buildings, but generally that's worse rates, worse terms. It's not the really great, you know, 30 year fixed at super low rates that you can get if it's the building is warrantable. But of course, keep that in mind. If a building's barely not warrantable and you can get it at a 20% discount the one is, and you can get a loan for a slightly higher rate, that's probably a good, a good buy because there's kind of a shadow value there that's not being harnessed. Um, yeah, Chris, that, that's definitely worth keeping in mind. Chris Puglio, uh, episode 44. I, was, I actually had to send something similar to a non-warrantable one where basically the deal got held up like the last, it was a condo in Bronzeville, a six flat that uh, just kind of defunct HOA that uh, we're not sure where the HOA fees are going now at this point, but uh, uh, didn't go anywhere, but they, they do have a program. So uh, we'll link uh, Chris information here in the uh, notes as well. Good stuff. All right. So, so David, we're off to the races here. We're, we're buying bigger buildings. You know, it's, we're buying, you know, I, I saw it was like 20 units then 40, then 80. You're basically doubling it every year and then 600. Right. So like talk us through that process. Like it's just gotta be like chaos. Right. <laughs> it's like, by, so just walk through like some of those steps, some of the learning lessons for someone who's looking to scale. Yeah. So we talked about uh, getting investors, and it started off with just people that I knew, uh, you know, through work, people I was working with at AIG and things like that. And then through leveraging them and just asking them, hey, if you, you know anyone that could write a bigger check and slowly growing your network and getting to be some, getting to some investors who had bigger capacity, uh, it was kind of a perfect storm is that in 2016, I started getting investments from uh, uh, some smaller family offices and high net worth individ individuals that had a lot more capacity than the deal size I was doing because I was buying six flats and stuff like that. And back in back then, it was like six flats in Bronzeville in 2014, 15, 15 16. I was getting stuff for figure, maybe 50K a door that needed maybe 30K of work. So that's kind of where I was where I was getting deals at. And the perfect storm came along that I was able to do uh, to sell a package to an institutional buyer and we made a pretty big hit there so that all my investors who were new that had more capacity had it been my earlier investors even if with a big hit and they're like hey now now it looks like you know what you're doing i want to invest more they didn't really have much more they could have invested but i was lucky that i had investors that had capacity far more than i was tapping into and when i sold a bunch of buildings and there's a big hit they went from being tepid about the chicago, south side chicago strategy to, wow, this is pretty awesome and we want to do more. So we pretty quickly 1031 a lot of the money. That's why we were able to buy a lot because I had a lot of pressure now. And now I had to go find a bunch of deals because I had a lot of dollars sitting in a 1031 account that if I didn't deploy, then we lost its tax advantage. So we kind of went on a huge buying spree. And because I knew what their thresholds were of what was a good deal versus what they saw in New York, because a lot of these investors are New York and California based, that everything almost at just fair market price or top of the market price was still a really good deal compared to what they could get elsewhere. And, and the craziest part was that I also realized that they weren't getting materially better debt terms in San Francisco or LA or New York city than, than I could get in the South side of Chicago. So even if let's say you could get 50 basis points better on, on, on debt, but I was getting a cap rate that was, you know, 500 basis points better. It was a total no brainer for our investors to be literally setting records in Bronzeville being the highest buyer in 2017 of a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff. So we had 1031 money and investors with a lot of capacity and I'd kind of locked in my early track record. So that was the perfect storm, which allowed us to have the capital to go in and buy a lot in 2017 and 18. Um, and so that, that was a whirlwind. It was like, I was getting things under contract left and right, closing things, I was hearing rumors that I was the biggest idiot in the world for paying 80K a door for stuff in Bronzeville. Uh, and, and I was fine with that. 
and because the numbers still work because at the time it was still like uh maybe on a broker offering memorandum a 12 percent cap rate in reality probably it was a nine uh and probably because we weren't we were just learning how to uh manage it well it probably ended up being an eight but even then then i could get debt still sub five so i had a three percent net leverage spread even when i messed up so you know so we had a big learning curve uh in that, in that growth period uh that really pressure tested us and we learned a lot and it was very stressful. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I guess let's, let's pivot. Then you mentioned Brownsville and some of these other South side neighborhoods. What were some of those challenges, right? Like what was, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes on with, you know, Chicago in general, it's very tenant friendly as we've discussed, you know, at nauseum here, talk about some of those challenges and what you might've done differently from the management perspective. Yeah. Uh, well, so first of all, if you haven't operated in the South Side of Chicago and you're just looking at it, just you hear stories, South Side of Chicago is rough. I would say, first of all, that's that's over exaggerated. Um, but it's not that it's easy, but it's just that not everywhere in the South Side is the same and not every asset class in the South Side is the same. Um, but the challenges were less about it being the South Side and more about just going from 400 units down to basically 250 units when we did a big sale and then growing from 250 units to basically over a thousand in under 18 months. Um, and that growth, whether it was Southside Chicago or anywhere, I think would have been very, very challenging. And I think the biggest difference is, so you hear Southside Chicago, you hear collections are tough and it's tough to manage. Our collections prior to our kind of hyper growth phase were near a hundred percent, which might sound crazy because it wasn't just all bronze, though, it was also, tougher areas like it was we had stuff in chatham we had stuff um uh, south shore jackson park uh things like that but we were nearly 100 percent because i was personally making the collection calls i was personally meeting with residents who were past due um and, and i was working out deals to where we didn't have a ton of evictions and we had extremely high collections uh now it was very stressful we got close to 400 there but from zero to 200, we were near hundred percent. And then it started trailing off because I had Jared and Jessica also help me with collections, not saying there's anything wrong with, with their abilities. They were, they were just newer to it. And, uh, but as you get beyond that, you go from being, you go from being able to basically do all your collection calls and all your high touch stuff and all your escalated issues, deal with the resident whose heat goes off on Christmas Eve and like talking them off of a ledge and figuring out something personally to make it happen. Cause you're taking that call on Christmas Eve at 11 PM personally, whereas it's not, not, not for, it's not easy to find a property manager who will take that call and be able to deal with it with the same care that you would, because they don't own the building you do, you do. So as, as you kind of tried to copy yourself, as you got further from the source, it was a lot harder to just have that like kind of perfect hands on this that you really need. And we, we started losing some of that. So our collections, and our hyper growth phase went from being, I think, basically perfect to dropping off to where we, ha we had some bad months that were scary and we had to really figure out and change our operation. And, and we were doing that along, along the way and we realized that what worked for 200 units barely worked at 400 units. And then we kind of reset it. What worked from 200 to 400 definitely didn't work at 1,000. Uh, and so we were just constantly working on the operation and realizing that we probably couldn't be as perfect. So we had to make things simpler. Uh, and, that, and that was just a, a huge, you know, growing pains. And it was just, it was tough. Yeah. I, I think uh, we, we had the similar uh, path. You know, we started buying stuff down there. Oh, wait, we ultimately bought just under 500 units and, and all on the South side. And ultimately we set out to find somebody to outsource it to. We thought our Northwest suburban management, you know, we'll, we'll outsource that South side stuff and could never find anybody. We started doing it ourselves, but that it was a learning curve and the learning curve came with a lot of work and a lot of, uh, you know, and I always tell people now the, the, the amount of touches you have for a two flat, uh, between tenants, the property, the maintenance section eight, all that stuff compared to a two flat in, uh, in Lincoln park is, is like eight to one. So, um, I, I hear you on the collections and as you're trying to grow and it, it gets from you, it, it was something we experienced as well too. Um, how have you guys, uh, you know, as your company's growing and your management company's growing, you guys have a lot of units in those type of neighborhoods. What, what have you guys like done differently to, uh, I'm saying this selfishly a little bit here too, to, uh, to kind of, oh, yeah. uh, 
the, the thing that a lot of property managers always say in, in the South side, uh, a lot of them stink, but it's not necessarily they stink. It's just, you have, there's so many areas to mess up in. There's so many of those touches. You miss one touch point, all of a sudden uh, gas gets shut off and, 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 you know, the tenants complaining because something fell in their, their, whatever it might be. Some crazy stuff happens on the South side. Like how have you guys been able to grow to be able to handle that type of uh, those type of touches? Yeah, it's, it's a great, great point. Um, so one thing, speaking of touches, right. It's, if you send someone to a building, that's one touch for the whole building, right? And so what we realized that we thought our management strain was caused by adding a bunch of units, but in reality, it was caused by adding a bunch of roofs. We realized that ultimately there's a problem at a 60 unit building, then I'm putting my head together with the property manager or head of CapEx. And as we've grown, we now have more roles, right? But whatever it was, I'm ultimately getting involved and I'm trying to solve a problem. And we solve a problem for a 60 unit building. We've like, let's say the roof has an issue or there's a permitting issue or the city violation issue. Then we have an action plan moving. That's going to solve a problem for 60 residents. Right. But the same issue happens on a two flat. And I spend the same amount of effort to focus through it. And we've solved a problem for two residents. Right. So we've been, we've tried our best since we kind of had that epiphany to try to have less buildings more units trying to get bigger buildings and we really see the benefit of buying bigger buildings uh for that for that reason um so it makes things more efficient it makes things more systematic it allows you to cover a lot more ground because if one manager can hit 15 buildings and that's 300 units a lot better than hitting you know the same uh, hitting uh the same amount of buildings and having it only be 30 units or 40 units because it's it's as many times as the stop park, get out of the car, go into the building, check the hallways, walk the building. That's one building, you know, maybe it's 10 minutes longer if it's 20 units or 30 units or 40 units, but it's a lot better than having, you know, 10 stops to check the same amount of units. Yeah. So let's talk so that's about one that. thing we've focused on. Yeah. And so that ties into the 300 unit you just purchased over by Midway. Let's talk through, you know, it's yeah, a that's, competitive market. Yeah. How did you find this thing? What did you like about it? You know, finding 300 units is, is very tough in this market. Yes. Uh, so that, that was a bit of a creative situation. Um, uh, but yeah, we have basically, that was a portfolio. It wasn't a 300 unit building. It was basically 20, 20 buildings uh, that totaled 300 units, but they're all in a very tight group to where it has kind of the economy of scale as if uh, you bought roughly 300 unit buildings, because a lot of them are really close to each other. Um, but that's, that's an opportunity that arose just in general. You have a lot of people who've operated in these areas for a long time and they may be bought the buildings when you could only rent them for $150 in, you know, 30 years ago. And now they're renting them for $800, but the market rent is 1100 and they just don't want to go through it again with the renovation upgrades of the whole building all over again and do that again and do that last push. So there's, you can find these owners who have these portfolios and uh, there's meat on the bone and, and they're willing to get out and leave meat on the bone because they understand that it's not worth top of the market value because it's uh, not a perfectly perfect condition or perfect rent roll. One or the other. I mean, there's always reasons and they don't have, they don't want to do that same effort again. And if they could have one uh, buyer that they're confident they can execute, they might be willing to sell you their portfolio or a chunk of it. So that, that's, that's what that was. And that's lucky. That's not, that's a one-off, you know, and we think we'll probably have some of those here and there. We've had one of those before, but that's not something we can count on for being able to always find these constantly, but they're out there, you know, one day, maybe we'll be in that position where we want to just start winding things down and we're going to, we'd rather have a discounted execution, sell the whole thing, than sell it off to, you know, through in, in each individual building one by one. Um, even if you're getting top of the market doing that, that's a much more painful process. And also that scale too, there's some level of legacy you're leaving behind also. Is it, do you want to sell it to one uh, buyer who you're confident is capitalized well enough to take care of it and do well? Or, or do you want to sell it to 50 different buyers to where maybe, you know, 15 of them run the building into the ground and it's kind of like people remember it as your building and it looks like crap. They don't know who ran into the ground with you and somebody else. So it's, you know, there's something to that too, where you feel good, but being able to offload it to a good a, a guy who's going to do a good job. <clears throat> in these uh, neighborhoods that you are in, mostly C and D class might have some B minus maybe, but uh, 
you, you come across section eight a lot. What's your, do you guys have like a ratio on, on how many you keep market versus section eight? Do, do you even do section eight at all? Kind of give us your thoughts on that. We do, we do both. It, it's so case by case. It depends on the area. It depends on the building quality. It depends on everything. Um, in some areas, you know what know what section eight voucher would even want to apply for it if it's not top end quality. And in some areas, uh, some of section eight voucher because they let areas so great would apply for it even if the quality's not there. So just it's so many factors too. Um, they, they, would, they would determine whether we would you know well it's not even whether we would prefer it's that you put something up and you're going to get a lot of applications either you know section eight or or no section eight depending on the price point and the quality and the area. So. But we probably right now, if I had to guess, I think we're about like 30% Section 8 and 70% market. Uh, that was flipped um, back in 2017 and prior. We were probably 75% Section 8. So we've been, it's been a lot more market as time's gone on. And part of that's just the areas we bought a lot in. We bought a lot in Bronzeville to where uh, Section 8 vouchers in a lot of the areas we own in don't, don't, wouldn't cover what, what the Bronzeville rent would be. Uh, if you if it's nice renovated product and so that that that's kind of just naturally sort of occurring it, we're not like trying to take less it just ended up happening that way you're seeing a lot of section eight uh move around with the mobility programs moving to neighborhoods that they weren't traditionally in a and b class type neighborhoods uh, i know tom you and i are working on some right now um up in uh albany park i think it is and uh Give, give some advice, any tips or advice you have for people looking to get, I get a lot of other people that call me up and say, I want all section eight buildings. Any advice or tips you give uh, uh, soon to be investors on the program? Yeah. I mean, so, so I remember the first time I bought something in the South side that I was so excited to have my first section eight voucher to come in. I didn't really know how to, how to deal with it, but I was excited. I'm like, wow, this is guaranteed rent. Right. And so that's what, you know, that's the headline. It's guaranteed rent, but there's a lot of uh, things that come with that. I mean, you have mandatory inspections every single year. And so you take that into account. What's the cost for that? I mean, sometimes there is not much of a cost to pass inspection, but sometimes uh, there could be a lot of wear and tear in a unit and, and you, could have, you could have a lot of costs. So factor that in. It's tough to really factor that in. Uh, it's also a lot of administrative work just to make sure you get it in. And then once you turn it in, I remember the first time I turned one in, I was like, okay, now I need this revenue to come in tomorrow. And it took me 90 days to get through to even get approved for it. And I didn't know what I was doing. So now we have a team that handles this so we can get things punched through very quickly, but it's, uh, it is a learning curve to know how to, to deal with that. And it's a totally different thing. Um, uh, I remember that to, you know, to get a hold of someone, you, you know, and get a hold of the right person's tough. You can always get a hold of someone in section eight, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a totally different game. Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's, if the grass is green. I mean, there, there, there's really is positives and there really, there really can be negatives too. So it's tough. I'm, I, it's tough to say that there's not like a silver bullet here to where it's like, it's totally better. or It's totally worse. It's, it uh, depends on the situation. Sorry to be so vague, but no, no, yeah. I like it. My, you know, my, my opinion, anyone that listens knows that I, I think uh, in the C and D class areas, when you're solely in there, say you have a, a four flat or six units in South shore, like I'm very uh, um, to the, point of own, almost going 50, 50. Um, I think you have, uh, the pros and yeah. cons of both and they kind of balance each other out. And that, that's kind of how we always, uh, grew our portfolio. We were back in 2009, 10. I mean, there wasn't many great market tenants in these neighborhoods and we were probably about 80%. So similar to how your path was. No, to totally. And, um, the, the only, the only thing is that things can happen to where if you are, uh, you could have, a, maybe you have an issue with something and then the, all of a sudden the whole building, you, you have to deal with not going into abatement, right. Or something like that. And so there's, there's, there's such strong positives and, and, and there can be negatives too, but yeah, I agree. In, in a D area, uh, section eight is going to be, you know, a hundred percent guaranteed money versus you could, it's really easy. It's really tough to underwrite well and get, uh, a high confidence that you're going to get all your money coming in every month uh, without section eight in some areas. So totally. Yeah. So David, we're still building mo most of the portfolio on the South side here. Even yeah. after we've seen this run up in Bronzeville, where are you still investing? Why are you still bullish? Right? Like it's, it's awesome to see this. And I want that message to get out to our listeners that there's people still just killing it down there. What, what excites you? Like, why are you still in Chicago, the South side? Why are you still bullish? Why are you still here? Why are you still investing here? 
Yeah. So, I mean, okay. So first of all, it's despite everyone constantly saying there's depopulation and stuff like that, it's if you actually go do the research, it's not as grim as headlines like to make it. I mean, that's yeah, just we, it's we funny. The other day, out of curiosity. Right? Yeah, yeah. Out of curiosity, I just, I, I looked at my phone and just searched New York City, where my New York City investors are always complaining how, oh, it's shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking. And I'm like, wait, looks like New York City actually lost more people the last five years than Chicago. But that's not, I guess, exciting news or uh, that doesn't hit a narrative or something. So it's still the third biggest city in the United States. Uh, even though some people say, no, Houston's there. No, it's not. It's still Chicago, right? So that, that's, I think that's got to count for something. It's extremely diverse business where it's not just finance. It's not just uh, tech. If tech gets hammered, it's a little bit of a decrease in Chicago. If tech booms, it's a little bit of an increase in Chicago. Uh, I, I talk to my investors like it, it's the mutual fund of cities where you have so many different industries uh, to where you get like a blended sort of if the, everything is going well, Chicago should get a bump. If everything's going poorly, it should get a decrease. But uh, so I, I like that. I also think there's something to be said once you have scale in a city that it's hard to just say the grass is green in another city and try to recreate that scale there because that really does help. Um, I've ventured into Indianapolis and to Detroit. Um, and while on paper, some of our buys over there have been better on paper than in Chicago, that's theoretically on paper. But in actuality, due to various things that come up, we don't have a maintenance team there. Uh, that where we have a full staff maintenance team here with all sorts of trades. We have to outsource so many things. So that hurts you. Uh, we also don't have um, permanent uh, property managers there, you know, there at all times. So, or in some cases doing third party management, which we have to do, which isn't as efficient. Whereas here we have our full team built out. We don't understand the city regulations as well there as we do now uh, versus Chicago. Chicago now, now we, we, under, we understand how to operate here. So once you kind of understand that's that's worth something as well. Um, but the south side too, it's the opportunity is still great. Even though Bronzeville prices have shot through the moon, it's you still look at where cap rates are versus let's say the equivalents in other cities. So figure Bronzeville in a lot of ways has similar data to like Harlem, uh, where it's you know very close to downtown Chicago, just as Harlem's very close to midtown Manhattan, uh, probably about the same distance. Actually, uh, Bronzeville's closer. Uh, and with that close of a radius to downtown, I don't know how the cap rates are even still really where they are versus you look at other cities, other markets, and the cap rates are much tighter. Uh, and, and in those other cities, unless it's L.A. or New York, are lower populated cities. So uh, w why would buying in a similar area to Bronzeville in Houston be at such a premium to Chicago or, you know, same thing for other, other places? Uh, so I still think your risk adjusted returns here are, are good as long as you know how to run it and you can, that's a learning curve. But once you get there, I think it really makes sense and it's a great city. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I miss it when I'm out of town. So it's a, uh, it's a really fun city. It's a great city. And, um, yeah. That's funny. You say that about different cities and you're way bigger than us, but I say that about uh, West side versus South side. People call me about West side management all the time. I'm like, I, I can't have two C and D class, uh, operations, like too much, the two, it's a whole different set of uh, resources to operate in both those. Totally. Well, it's so true. We're offered stuff in the West side all the time, but it, I look at the same way. If I, if I can't get at least 200 units out there, I can't really set up like a satellite operation over there and the travel time between, you know, anywhere in the South side, we operate in Bronzeville, Washington Park, Jackson Park, Woodlawn, South Shore, uh, near Midway. Uh, any of those areas are too far away from the West side to really get there or else you have a maintenance tech doing three work orders a day. Cause he hits one in the West side, comes down, does them back there. It's not efficient. And and unless you have 200 units, you can't keep one maintenance tech occupied a whole day out there. It, no. So I, I'm a suburban kid, like uh, I'm out in St. Charles and like I go in and out of the city, no problem. I can hit 10 stops in, in, in a day, in, uh, in a half a day throughout uh, South Suburbs, West Side. But our techs for some reason or somebody like they, they really have, they struggle to move around the city like fast. Like it's like almost a mental block of like, oh man, I gotta go to the North Side today or I gotta go to the West Side. Like uh, like some of, uh, you know, our attorney even like, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out to St. Charles. You got a hotel out here. It's like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> the, like uh, suburban people going to the city. It's not as big of an obstacle as a, a city person coming out to the burbs or having to go around to different uh, segments of the city. It's funny. Totally. 
No, it's, it's trans. It's a real thing. I, I learned that, uh, I didn't really have that epiphany until I read Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And it talks about how it just focuses on travel being so much. Like, you take your army this far, then they lose this much efficiency. I'm like, this is nonsense. And I'm just buying in Detroit, buying in Indianapolis, and then realizing, oh, my God. Like, I really wish I, I had, like, a new – you need a nucleus. You need, you need a, a home base. Um, just even traveling from south side to west side is – it just kills your efficiency. Uh, so our thought is in different markets – we would need to find a deal that's over 200 units to at least have enough to set up a satellite over there that where on market rate property management fees can fund kind of a, some local site people you need there. Uh, and if not, then it's just not worth going into a new market. Um, yeah. And, and literally too, we look at other markets just, just to make sure that we're not in an echo chamber, that we're not blind to other opportunities. Cause yeah, if there's a place where all of a sudden it's just nothing but 11 caps and I want to like explore, but I think the South side of Chicago of, of any major city, it seems to be the best cap rates that we can find. And we're constantly looking for stuff, you know? So. No, that's great. Great stuff. This, this reminds me of the, the Noel Burke episode we had where it's just the returns are there so, and the money will follow and the operators will follow. And, and so it, while the music's going here, like it's there. Um, I, I think what you guys were talking about travel, yeah. one thing that, that always upsets me, the South side of Chicago is over a million people in population. It's bigger than, you know, Denver. It's bigger than, you know, Minneapolis. It's bigger than some of these major metropolitans and it gets lumped in. And we've even done it on the show. We ask you like, hey, how's it operating in the South Side? Like, like, that's a poor question because you wouldn't just ask them like, hey, how's it operating in Denver? Right? It's, there's multiple classes. There's multiple different. It, it, it's, it's diverse. It's crazy. Like, it's completely different in, in one area compared to the other. No, and it's, and it's interesting because we're a top, we have about 2,000 units in the South Side of Chicago. Uh, that we, we own and we manage third party, we manage another basically 500. So we manage about 2,500 units in the South side of Chicago. So no matter what metric you're using, we're probably a top five operator in the South side of Chicago. If not, I, I think we're maybe third or something like that, but it's funny. It has, does not have the same, uh, you know, effect that if I walked to a room and I'm like, I'm the third biggest operator in Denver, they'd be like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, that that's less impressive than being third. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is, <laughs> South of Chicago is bigger, you know, and it's, it's more important. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. But I think that exactly is the reason why there's still an opportunity, because people, uh, for whatever reason, have their, their reasons for they think that the South Side doesn't make sense or they don't want to be there. Or they heard on the news that it's tough. But I'm from Oakland, California, where everywhere I went my whole life, everyone was like, oh, Oakland, that's really rough. And it's like, have you ever been there? No. But they'll talk trash about it. And South Side of Chicago is the same thing. And now Oakland, I think, is the top five most expensive city in the United States, or I know it's top 10. Uh, and everyone's like, how did that happen? It's like, well, you were just talking shit about it, and you didn't even look at it. Whereas I was in Chicago buying stuff in the West Loop and South Loop, and I uh, you know, was hearing people with bars and stuff talking about how bad the South Side is. And then one day I'm like, wait, have you ever been there? And people are like, oh, uh, no, but, but like, it's terrible. It's like, <laughs> so I, I literally rented a car one day. And I literally just like serpentine, like drove every single block, like in the South side over a course of a week. I spent an entire weekend driving everywhere in the South side to really understand it. And just like Oakland, where I grew up, there were some rough blocks and there were some good, great blocks. And it was a big mix of things. And I found some areas that I identified as these areas look really interesting. And some of them were, you know, because I knew nothing about it. I just went into it totally objectively. I have no tie to Chicago until I started buying here. Uh, and I mean, my, my wife's family is from the Chicago suburbs, but she had no intentions of moving back here. She was living in New York. Uh, so that was my only tie, but that wasn't the reason why I bought here. Uh, but just driving through everything, I'm like, oh, wow, Hyde Park was really awesome. I'm looking at price. I'm like, oh, the prices are crazy. But then it was like, Bronzeville makes tons of sense because where it is radius wise downtown and the prices were really cheap. And I'm like, call me crazy. I'm just going to start buying stuff in Bronzeville. And then also that list with East Woodlawn. Those are my two first places that I identify like this just objectively, not just taking no pre eliminating all preconceived notions, those made the most sense by far. And it reminded me of Oakland, specific areas in Oakland that were very similar to those two areas that everyone's like, oh, these areas are terrible. And then all of a sudden, wait, how did it get so expensive? It doesn't make sense. Like, well, I don't think you were looking, you know? And I think that's, that's what I see about the South side of Chicago. Awesome, man. Also show we could probably go for another hour easily, but we're going to move to our wrap up. Get to the wrap. Yep. Mike drop and get to the wrap there. Yep. Mike drop. Yep. <laughs> All right. So how, what's your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do what you've done when others wish they could? 
Uh, well, I think part of it's luck that I got lucky that I got hooked in with some uh, good investors at the right time to where I was able to get them an early exit and get them to have the confidence to reinvest. The easiest time to go get someone to invest dollars when you're with your right hand handing them a check back for all their money and then saying, oh, and with your left hand, here's a new deal. So I was lucky that that happened and I was able to show new deals right away while I had 1031 money locked up. And that really helped me to scale. So that's how I got in there and grew from, you know, not having really anything in the South Side Chicago to having a lot. Uh, and that, that was, that, then part of that was that I lived in New York at the time, where in New York, uh, you know, you, you can't walk into a bar without being around many millionaires. I mean, it's just, it's an easy place to raise money if you have good deals. Uh, and so that was, that was helpful. Uh, but I think my competitive advantage since then, and I, and I, I hate saying this could almost negates what I'm saying is that I, I really try to approach everything without preconceived notions in general. I think that as soon as I start thinking that I know something and something's definitely set this way, that, that I, I, that it apparently puts blinders on. And every time that I've made a mistake or had an issue, like we had, you know, when also we had a panic, like, Oh my God, collections dropped for a little bit. How do we fix it? It was because I thought everything was just going to continue exactly how it was. And I, and I started to gain preconceived notions that yes, of course we're going to continue to collect, you know, almost hundred percent of rent, everything that we do. And then that was a terrible assumption. Right. And so just really, really trying to discipline myself, take a step back, not, not having an issue if anyone or organization corrects me, trying to keep it flat to where everything from the, the no one or organization, we now have, let's say roughly 55 people. Uh, I, I try to keep it as open door as possible to where if anyone thinks we're, about, where we're going towards an iceberg, I want them to know and not be, think that they're going to be embarrassed to tell me just to make sure that we can make adjustments constantly and keep growing and, and, and not be stuck in our ways. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if that's competitive advantage or not. We're also, we're also looking globally too, is that we have investors kind of from all over the country. Uh, we're looking at other deals, not necessarily to do other deals in other places, but just to make sure that this still is a good place to put capital and to kind of know everything holistically. So we're not just Southside Chicago, and that's basically all we buy. We try to kind of know everything. We want to know affordable housing. We want to know workforce housing. We want to know if our deals are still more competitive. We want to make sure that we can get competitive debt on it, that we're always looking nationally uh, for lenders. And we, we, we're not like, putting any sort of uh, uh, blinders on what we're doing. Good stuff. David, what's one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Um, uh, tough. Uh, I'd say just, and that sounds a little bit crazy, just buy something that's on the lower end of your price range. Just do it because you're not going to really learn about anything until you actually like do it. I mean, you can study it for forever. Uh, a mentor of mine uh, says there's basically, there's, there's, there's a type of person who just does this aim, 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 and never takes a shot. Right. And it's probably not saying it's always better to aim shoot, but if you're, if you, if you are aiming the 10th, 20th time, you haven't pulled the trigger yet, just pull the trigger or, or just stop wasting your time on this. I think, because you're never going to have all your variables figured out. Some deals I thought I made huge mistakes on that I overpaid afterwards turned out to be some of my best deals. Some deals that I was like, Oh my God, I hope this closes because I'm stealing this from this person. They're such an idiot. Once they find out we're some of my worst deals. Right. So it's, and now I know why those deals were good and the other deals were bad. And so you constantly keep updating your knowledge base, but it, it takes doing some deals and you learn a lot more from your failures and you do from your successes. In fact, some of my early successes were some of the worst things that happened to me because I figured, of course, this is what's going to continue to happen. I keep doing this. And, and it's the failures that actually make change. Cause you're like, what? Well, I can't do that again. Um, and so you, you know, I don't know. So just go out there and make mistakes and get some wins and some losses, you know? Uh, Perfect. Just, just get out there and make a transaction. And then you'll learn so much more than you'll learn from any book or any podcast. Just make your first transaction and see how that goes. Love it. I, I love that advice. I love it. Um, you, you have a little more risk in the, in the market, higher pricing than you might have 10 years ago, but still, you can still do it. Just buy something conservative. Oh, okay, fine. So the advice on that is cash flow. Is that buy something the lower end of your price range? that at least on paper should be a, at least a little bit cash flow positive pretty quickly. So then if you're off, you're not bleeding and you don't become a desperate seller because the number one way to find a good deal is you find a desperate seller. So you just don't want to be that. You don't want to be a good deal for somebody else because you're, you're screwed. And if the market collapses, but you still have some positive cash flow, 
you're never a desperate seller because you're never toast. Uh, you're never like, okay, I have 10 months left uh, b- before I'm going to bleed out. It's that, well, I'm not making much money, but I'm not bleeding. So you could stay there for years. All right, David, what do you do for fun? For fun? Uh, well, I work quite a bit, um, but um, love uh, hanging out with friends, having drinks, going out, uh, just kind of uh, decompressing. And um, I used to play football, uh, but don't you know play anymore. I mean, it uh, wasn't a league when I was in New York. But uh, uh, in a competitive fantasy football league, that's uh, pretty fun. Now that's over now. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, really, I mean, I actually, to be honest, what I do for fun is I work on this business and keep growing this. I'm here, this might make me sound like a loser, but I'm here on Saturdays and Sundays. It's fun to go out with clients. It's fun to go out with investors, uh, go on trips with them, uh, uh, go out to dinners with them. Uh, but yeah, like really, like I, I have fun growing this and trying to like keep taking this to the next level. So that's kind of a weird answer. It's like an interview question for myself that, that someone would say to me that I wouldn't believe them if they, if I interviewed them and they said, oh, I like growing the business. Like that's bullshit. Uh, uh, but I really do. I mean, I, I love it. I'm in my office more than in my house for sure. Not even close. Like I'm in my house to basically sleep. My mentor, uh, yeah. my mentor and my shrink told me I, I need to find a hobby because I feel the same way as you. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's like, it was embarrassing. I'm like, what can I say? I don't know what to say is what I like to do for fun. But I mean, I, I do like, at this point, what's funny, and, and I'm not just saying this in case I'm being audited, but uh, like ba- at this point, basically all of my friends uh, and anyone that I would have a drink with or go out with are, are basically people I either do business with, they're people at my organization, or they're potential investors. And they're all uh, like legitimate write-offs. Like I write off every dinner I have because every single person I spend time with is actually someone who is an investor, could be an investor, someone that I could work with, potentially a new GC, a new, uh, a, 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 an agent that might have some deals coming up. And that's kind of like my friend group is people that are involved in this business. And I keep adding people who I can do deals with, uh, you know, into my circle. And that's, that's who I hang out with. I also just love that idea of, I'm just going to go on record and say that, whether it's true or not. I know you're saying it is true, but <laughs> I do love that angle there. Like, oh, I'll just go on and see, you know, I, I was recording. All I was thinking about is our, our podcast can get entered in some uh, IRS audit case down the road uh, as evidence. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I'm down. I'm down. Uh, I want to get subpoenaed for something. So funny. <laughs> so, uh, don't want that. Did, oh, David, man, what's a good book, book, podcast, or self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners? Well, this is obviously the best podcast. There you go. Um, no, uh, no, to be honest, I don't really uh, listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a good book. It sounds funny. And got, reading Rich Dad Poor Dad was such a good book. Kind of got my head thinking around cash flow. And it seems like what a cliche recommendation. But I read that and that got me to be like, I need to buy another condo. This just makes a lot more sense. Uh, and you understanding cash flow. I read some other books like his, his book on property management, his book on real estate investing. Those are all extremely useful, despite the fact I hate saying mainstream stuff like my favorite movie is fight club it's like yeah so is every guy within five years of your age too you know uh but that it's just like one of those right uh but those uh, great books um i also uh like i mean read, read, read a lot of books that i, I think you, i think just try to read a book every month or at least every other month i think is huge hugely important like nonfiction books they all have some impact they all have a three or five percent that are uh, of huge value. Like actually think and grow rich. I read a long time ago. I, I, I still use principles in that constantly to plan my years. Uh, it's good for goal setting and thinking about things and, and actually psycho cybernetics, not real estate related, but really good about just like having a good self vision and figuring out how to optimize yourself and, and be the best you can be. Uh, that, that's one that I, I recommend a lot. And those are books I read well before I did my first real estate investment. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network that you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Well, I don't want to give away any of my brokers. Uh, <laughs> so unfortunately, a lot of people that I'd recommend, I, I, I don't want to say it on a forum. Um, who can I say that? And I also don't want to recommend my GCs or else that my, my price to do my own GCs is going to go up when, when all your listeners start uh, asking for quotes. You uh, referred to us by Renovo. So there's your, your guy, uh, jail free card, uh, if you want to use, use that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, tr- I'm still trying to broker those guys to people. So, uh, you know, with our in-house, uh, we broker it to our property management clients. But yeah, no, uh, Renovo is awesome. Uh, I highly recommend them. 
the fact they can do just common sense loans so quickly without making you go through all these hoops and boxes and the fact they can get draws out so quickly. I, I wish they could do every single type of loan that we, we need. Um, and if they could, I probably wouldn't go to another lender ever. And I would just work with them. And I, I have been working with them even on some of their stuff when they're more expensive for our renovation loans. And people are like, wait, you guys, are your size is silver Novo. It's like, yeah, they, they, they can put money out fast. Not no, no red tape. I treat it like it's cash because I know they're going to be there. Whereas I have some more institutional types that would lend at a much lower rate, but they're a lot fee heavy, a lot more fee heavy, and they're a lot slower, not necessarily as reliable. So I, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I love Renovo. I, I like that reference of common sense. It's a good way to describe them. They're good at the, they're good at looking at something and being real about it versus uh, making you jump through hoops. Totally. It's unnecessary. Totally. Yeah. Even I'm on a much smaller scale, just that reliability, man. Like you put earnest money out there and you're saying cash offer, you know, and you're going to use an acquisition line in the background. They better come through. Right. Like that's, you know, just even on a smaller scale and you're doing it at much at a much larger, like, you know, putting a lot of dollars hard or whatever it might be. You got to have the backup. Oh, and, right? and let me tell you something. Is it earnest money? Even if it's refundable, it doesn't necessarily mean it's refundable. It also doesn't mean that you're not going to be in court for two years trying to get it back. Right. So you want to make sure that you can close, you know, when you put that earnest money out and then you can close in a timely fashion, because you'll definitely lose it if you don't close in time, if you make it non-refundable. Uh, but you need to know that you're going to close. Too. And for those, what? Lose the broker relation too. Right. Even on a macro level, it'll affect that. Oh, to- totally. To- I mean, depends. You might not because brokers like selling buildings. And when you want to give, if you give them a listing, uh, even if you had a, it's, they'll, they'll probably take the listing later. Um, you, can buy back. you can buy the loyalty back. <laughs> you can buy yourself back. That's for sure. But yeah, no, uh, Renovo is awesome. Uh, and they're really reliable. I, I've actually yet to have them not be able to close except for one time, but there's good reasons why they didn't close. Um, and, um, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, they're, they're extremely reliable. Awesome. David, you, you provided so much value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Uh, well, um, okay. Uh, so I've always wanted to uh, write a book on just kind of like how to do this. But I was actually doing this too much to ever write that book. So I got about 80 pages in and uh, kind of just, just like, well, I'm just going to keep doing this. And uh, never finished it. So um, one day when that book's done, which maybe if I have any dead time at any point in time, the next five years, I'll finish it. Hopefully the, the data that I have there is still relevant. Um, that'll be a way that they can learn more about me. Um, but that's not there yet. Uh, ways that they can help me is if anyone finds off-market deals uh, that are uh, in, you know, Bronzeville, Woodlawn, Washington Park, you know, our target areas I mentioned earlier, Jackson Park, South Shore, near Midway that are over 10 units and have a low per door cost. You know, if they're more, the more jacked up, probably the better, the more we can add value. Uh, we'll be able to buy it uh, if, if it fits our strike zone. So we love getting good flow of off-market deals. And I could send them to uh, info at Icarus Investment Group. Actually, no, we've we got a new domain too. So info at Icarus.co. So info at Icarus.co, they can send them there and we'll respond relatively quickly if it hits our strike zone or not. And then secondly, uh, if anyone is an accredited investor, we're launching a new fund right now. And so, uh, you know, they can get more details off our website at Icarus.co. So Icarus.co uh, and they can fill out an inquiry there. And uh, if they're accredited, then um, we can talk about our, our new fund that we're launching because I, I, I'm pretty excited about that. And it's going to help because one of the strains we had in the past is that we did each deal one by one. So we had like 35 different partnerships. We've now consulted all those, but administratively it was like we had to close out one set of books every single day from the previous month. And we'd still be five behind, you know? So it was, it was crazy. So now we've consulted almost all of our partnerships. We realized to grow in the future, we don't want it to be a partnership per deal because that way we can attack those smaller deals and not create all these new partnerships again and have, 35 sets of books we have to close out every single month. So now we've consolidated it to where we only have about, I think, five partnerships or so, and we're going to launch this new fund. And that's going to be my main focus the next two years is just getting out there and just 
buying up all the buildings that are kind of on the lower side of what we're looking for because they're generally the most profitable like the 10 to like 30 unit buildings even though i'd rather have 100 unit buildings i just can't find good deals there um so yeah so i'm definitely interested in talking to some accredited investors awesome good stuff all right so we wrap with the chicago fact now david i know you played some college football so we do have a football question here so you need some chicago roots probably though Mark, I'll give you a 50-50 shot here on getting this. That's my that's the line on Mark getting this one right here. All right, so just like how we're currently set up with a north side and south side baseball team, uh, most of our listeners are probably too young to remember that Chicago used to also have a north side and south side football team. What was the name of the team that graced the south side of Chicago up until 1959? You had the Chicago Cardinals. Is That's that correct, right? Mark. Is that it? Okay. They that is it. Don't field, guess thought, yourself. So you threw me off. I thought they played at Wrigley Field. You had, you had both the Bears and the Cardinals. The Cardinals played up there and then down here. It was the Stanleys that became the Bears, if I'm getting this correctly. Yes. And for a while, you had the Bears and the Cardinals, both in the city up until 59. Cardinals moved to St. Louis, where you they had both the Louis, yeah. football team as the Cardinals, and they eventually made their way out to Arizona. Yep. yep. One other fun fact on that. The Chicago Cardinals have the only distinction – are the distinction of being the only team in American professional football to score exactly four points in one game, two safeties. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I'm assuming they lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm assuming they lost, but that'd be awesome. A four nothing. It was four win. to three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Awesome show. Tom, thanks as always. Listeners, refer us to a friend today. Please help us uh, spread this podcast to other real estate investors in Chicago. We're already a niche podcast. So it means our audience can only cap uh, so big. But right now, I know we have capacity to add thousands more listeners to us weekly. So please share this with your investment clubs, your investment friends, your investment Facebook groups, and uh, and help us share the stuff that we're trying to pull out of our awesome guests like David with the rest of your friends, family, and fellow investors. So David, thank you. Tom, thank you. And we will see you soon. Thanks all.